Praise the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, tonight and open to the book of James. James chapter 1. Now, James was written by James, the brother of our Lord, half-brother of our Lord. And James happens to be, at the time of this writing, he's the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. And he's writing to a Jewish audience, to believers, Jewish believers that have trusted Christ, that have been scattered abroad due to the severe persecution and the trials that have come to the church at Jerusalem. So if there's anybody that knows about trials, James does. Matter of fact, James is the first book of the New Testament written. Because the New Testament's not laid out in chronological order. Somewhere between 47 and 51 A.D., not too long after Jesus' death and ascension to glory. But he's the pastor there in the Church of Jerusalem. The Church of Jerusalem was a poor church. They were a suffering, persecuted church. And the believers were basically running for their lives to get out of the severe persecution that was coming upon the church and believers there at Jerusalem. And that's why he writes this to us, uh, this letter to these uh, Jewish brethren that have become Christians and have trusted Christ, the Messiah, and are experiencing a great deal of trials and sufferings in their lives. And no different than us today. We're going to go through trials, church. You need to just realize that and mark that down. We are going to have trials of all different kinds and different sizes and shapes and everything. And they're going to have an effect on our lives, and it's depending on how we handle them and how we go through them. And James helps us with that as a pastor that has been struggling and his congregation struggling and the, the severe persecution. So he writes to them, begin reading and following along with me in James chapter 1. James, he introduces himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't have a problem admitting that he was a, a servant, which is a slave, a bond slave to his older brother, Jesus. Amen. To the twelve tribes, see now we know who he's writing to, which are scattered abroad, greeting. Gives them a greeting. My brethren, here's the greeting, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And that means various kinds or many kinds of trials or testings. That's what the word temptations there is. Why is that? Knowing this, that the trying or the testing of your faith worketh patience, endurance. Okay? But let patience, let endurance have her perfect or mature work that you may be perfect or mature and entire wanting nothing. Now remember, this is in severe trials and heavy trials that are going on. And then if any of you in the midst of these heavy trials you're going through, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, that means freely, and upbraideth not, that means no strings attached, and it shall be given him. Father, we thank you for tonight. We ask you would bless our time in your word, and Lord, may we truly get something from this tonight. We've heard a lot of times and teaching and messages, but it's always great and interesting is every time we go through it, you have something new for us. That's what's so neat about the word of God, and especially a time that we're going through right now ourselves. We're going through some tries and trying times, our testing times, in our lives of these many trials that we're going through. We ask you to help us now. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide, as he will guide us into all truth. He will speak the truth because he hears the truth from the one who is the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, thank you for this letter of encouragement that's given to us, and ask that you would bless it. Be with your servant now, Lord. We ask for your spirit once again and your power and anointing in this hour. Bring to remembrance the thing that Jesus has said to us. And Lord, give us illumination, understanding of your word. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
James, as they're going through all this, he came to the realization and what you and I need to do in the trials that we're going through, the different kinds, the different sizes, the different testing, the different lengths, the, dis uh, the difficulty times of them, the severity of them. I mean, that's how trials are, folks. We're not going to get out of this world without them. Nobody's going to leave this planet without going through some difficult times and trials and trouble. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. You're going to have trials. But you can be of good cheer because I've overcome them. Now that doesn't mean he overcame them. Now you've got to overcome them. You see, he set the example for you. That's why he said in Revelation to the seven churches, to him that overcometh. He didn't say to him that I've overcome for you. No, he said to you that overcometh. And we have to overcome trials and temptations and the things that we face and so forth that come into our lives just as he did. Did Jesus not overcome temptation? Yes, he did. He overcame temptation in the wilderness of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, as that's what the devil offered him. And he had to overcome those temptations. And so we have to overcome temptations in our lives, as well as trials and testings. And so we see here that God brings about trials and testings in our lives uh, so that we can uh, mature and come to a place of maturity in our lives. And, and that's the purpose of trials. God always has a purpose for something. This coronavirus just didn't pop up out of the clear blue sky and catch God by surprise. And that he didn't know what was going on. He knew this all along, and he's in absolute control because he is a sovereign God, and he controls and rules the universe, and there's nothing that can happen uh, without his permission. Even the devil has to get his permission to do something. God says, you can take my servant Job, and you can do what you want with him, but you can't kill him. You keep your hands off of him. And so the devil did everything he wanted to except kill him, because God wouldn't let him. And in all the trials and testings that Job went through, the Bible said never once did there was sin on his lips. Matter of fact, he said, blessed be the Lord. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, the Bible says, Job, sin not. So there's a good lesson for us. We're not to sin in the trials and testings we're going through. Three gifts, James tells us in these five verses, that the believer can have during trials. And we're going to take a look at them. Three gifts that he gives us that we're given here. The first one is understanding. The second one is patience. And the third is wisdom. When it comes to going through trials and testings, God gives us three wonderful gifts. He gives us understanding. He gives us patience. And he gives us wisdom. And we find that in these first five little verses. So let's take a look at them now that we've read it and go back. First of all, remember, we're reaching forth in 2020 in our church. All right, so the first thing we want to do is reach forth with understanding. Reach forth with understanding. Because that's what we want to take a look at. We're going to draw your attention to verse number 2. Because in verse 1 is his greeting as he greets us and tells us who he is. But I want you to notice God wants you and I to have understanding when we go through the trial. How many times have you gone through a testing or a trial and say, I just don't understand this. Come on, talk to me. I don't get this, God. What's going on? I don't understand this. Why I'm going through this. Why this is happening to me or my family? I just don't understand this. All right? Now, when we come to James, we, we, we learned that our brother, as much as he was down in the trial, let me share some things that happened in his life, if you study his life. He was suffering, yet reaching. He was reaching forth, okay? He was struggling, yet believing. This is James, all right? And so he was cast down, but not destroyed. See, this may be what you're going through your trials. He was filled with faith and trust. So as we look at, at this passage tonight, we want to look at these three gifts uh, that the believer is given here over trials. And that's understanding, patience, and wisdom. So if you're going through a trial tonight, or a test, or you know one that's coming up, just hang in there where they will, guarantee you. But our nation as a whole, we're going through a heavy trial right now. A time of, and it's interesting, 
All we hear about on the news now is testing, 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 testing. God wants to test you tonight in your trial. We're going to talk about real biblical testing. Okay, a time of testing our faith. Testing what we believe. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to reach forth in our trial with understanding. All right, in verse 2 here, notice he talks about it. Uh, he says there in verse 2, look what he says. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or diverse testings or many. That's what the word diverse means, many, many kinds. When you fall into that, he noticed the key word here is the word count. Okay, it's not joy, it's count. When we go through the trial, the word count also implies to have discernment, to be discerned, to, to, to have discernment, to, in other words, or to consider. When we're going through the trial, James says, I want you to give an accounting. That's what the word count means. There has to be an accounting. We're to take count. We're to take an accounting of what we're going through. You see, when we begin to understand and take an accounting of what we're going to, and then we begin to sit and to think, to consider what we're going through, then we begin to develop an understanding of why we're going through it. So when you go through the trial, you need to consider, and I'm talking about anything and everything. James says you need to sit down and consider this. You need to take an accounting of it. Take a look at it, think about it, whatever it is, and consider it, and, and put some thought to this, and think about it, and as you do, then you're going to begin to understand what's going on. But if we don't take time to think about it, if we don't time to take time to consider it, then we're going to find ourselves in trouble, and that's in everything. That's just like today is the, what we call the Sunday, we call the what? The Lord's Day, right? Whose day is it? Whose day? The Lord's day. Do we take time to think about that? Will we take time to consider that this is the Lord's day? And the Lord's day is the whole day. It starts at 12.01 a.m. this morning, and it'll end at 12 midnight tonight. It's a 24-hour day. Today is the Lord's day. Do we take time to consider that? Do we take time to think about that? So since it's his day, it's not my day. I have six days during the week that God gives me. But he says the seventh day is my day. It's the Lord's day. So if it's his day, then I don't have a right to mess with it. Amen. Oh, it's me. See, it's his day. It's not my day. I don't have a right to change it, to alter it, or go do what I want to do because it's not my day. It's his day. But we don't ever take time to give an account of that or to sit down and consider that, or to think about that, we just go and do. And if we're not careful, we find ourselves in a trial or a testing. Because we haven't taken time to consider it. There's something to give some thought to that in the days ahead. Okay, I just, that was a bonus. That's not my notes. I threw that in. That came from results of the whatever's going on here. Amen. So see, God wants us to understand. He wants to give us an account. He wants us to think. He wants to consider this thing in this accounting. And that's why he says, listen to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul says this, and he said unto me. Now Paul said, now how many think Paul was going through some trials? How many think he was being tested? Oh yeah, more than anybody, right? He said, and he said unto me, this is God, you remember what Paul said? Paul said, man, I got this thorn in the flesh three times. I've asked God to take it away and remove it. But notice what he said. God said unto me, in the, and I'm going to just throw something in here for you to think about. I'm not adding to the word of God, just trying to make it where we live, all right? And God said unto me that in the midst of my trial, in my testing, I want you to know that my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect, complete, or mature, Paul, in your weakness. Then Paul comes back and responds to that in the midst of a heavy trial, of the midst of a thorn that was in his flesh, that God sent the devil as a buffet to buffet him. He said, most gladly then, you see, what did Paul do? He took the time to consider it. 
He took the time to think about it. He took the time to give an account of it. Because you see, no doubt when Paul wrote Corinthians, he had read James chapter 1. Brother Paul, James is writing, I want you to count this all joy. I want you to give some accounting to this trial, Paul. I want you to consider it. I want you to think about it. And so then he did. And he comes up with his conclusion. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my infirmity. I'd rather glory in my trial, okay, in my testing, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, there was the purpose of the trial, Paul, if you'll do some considering to it, if you'll think about it and consider this and take time you'll, and give an account of it, you're going to find out God had a purpose in it so that, Paul, that my strength would make you powerful. That the power of Christ, Paul says, may rest upon me. You see, God wants to use you. God wants His power on you. See, we always so quickly want God to get us out of the trial when God wants to conform us in the trial. Don't pray for God to get you out of the trial. Paul did. But Paul realized God was trying to conform him, and so he says, man, uh, uh, bring it on. Because if it's going to cause the power of Christ to rest upon me, then that's what I want more than the trial, than the suffering. Amen. So we have this accounting of the trial. In verse 3, I want you to see something else wonderful about this understanding. So to have understanding in your trial, give some accounting to it. Get some accounting to it. Consider it. Think about it. That God has a purpose for it and a reason for it. That's what you want to discover. All right, but we also understand that they're with assurance. You see, this, with this understanding comes assurance. See, God has a purpose in all of this. Okay, Amen. You see, when, and, and James says, when you fall into diverse temptations, you see, I want you to count it all joy. See, the purpose of this is that we're going to go through this, but we have the assurance there's going to be joy. We have the assurance that, uh, believer, God has a purpose for this trial you're in. He's got a purpose for it. Okay? And you see, you're never going to have a testimony until you have a test. You won't have a testimony for the Lord until you have a test. God's never going to lose you greatly until He tests you deeply. Trust me on that one, brother. Okay? Listen to what Acts 11 says. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now let me tell you something, church. The world is watching us right now. The world is watching the church and believers and how we're going to respond and handle this testing, this trial that we're going through. And if we will sit down and give an account of it, if we will consider it and look at the purpose that God has for it, for us, then it will become, then when we come through it, we will have a testimony to those who have no hope. We'll have a testimony to those that are looking for an answer. And the answer is not in Washington. The answer is not in a vaccine, you see, or a chip. That's not the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. And they have got to see your faith and my faith in it. And that's why we got to have this maturity in the trial. Otherwise, we're going to fall apart like the world's falling apart. Somebody was sharing with me after the service this morning or whatever, or something about the a crew out there that, oh, yeah, now they've opened up all the bars and everybody's going in and getting drunk. Well, they were already drunk before they got in the bar. But, see, that's how they're, that's how they're handling their trial. They're going to find their answer and solution in a bottle. Amen. That's not the answer. That's not the solution. I mean, you can drink yourself to a stupor, but that's not going to help you any. Amen. So God gives us understand with assurance. He gives us this understanding with assurance as we're reaching forth. All right, now, now let me give you something. This trials come many different flavors and kinds and sizes. And right now, our nation is going through a serious trial, a serious tested called the COVID-19 virus. That's not really that big a flu or virus to begin with. Let me share eight other trials that our country went through. And we didn't shut the country down. In 2004, we had the SARS virus. In 2008, we had the Avon virus. 
In 2010, we had the swine flu. In 2012, we had MERS. In 2014, we had Ebola. In 2016, we had uh, Zika. Zika. Z-I-K, we had the Zika virus in 2016. In 2018, we had a second round of Ebola. And in 2020, we had the COVID-19. And all of those seven other viruses that we never shut down the country took out ten times the amount of people that we've lost in this virus. So you see, trials will come in all different sizes and flavors and colors. There are enough testings. And this is a test. Forget the world in this thing. God wants to know how we're going to act. We're his kids. We're his believers. We claim to have faith. We claim to be mature in Christ. So we get a little trial comes our way and we fall apart. We collapse. We get scared to death. Oh my, the world's coming to an end. We go outside, we're going to die. Don't leave your home. My goodness. Sit down and get it. So I have assurance. That's why you see with the assurance, I'm able to count it all joy. You see, when I have an understanding, church, of the trial, I have an assurance that God has a plan and purpose in it for me. Then I'm able to say, well, as James, count it all joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Our brother Peter writes about trials too. He says, when you're going through a heavy, manifold trial, he says, I say rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Where's all of our rejoicing been? That's why we're trying to go upbeat, man. Second coming this morning, he's coming. Keep tuning in tonight by midnight. It could happen. The father will tell the groom, go get your bride. We have a perfect example of that in the New Testament. Of the ten virgins and the ten lamps. And the bridegroom came at midnight. Five of them were ready. And off they went with the groom. The other five didn't make the trip. See? Oh, boy. Oh, I got to wait. Got to wait. Number two tonight. Patience. So the first thing we want to learn in the trial is to have understanding. You need to reach forth with understanding. And reach forth with accounting of that understanding. And reach forth with assurance of, that, uh, of understanding. All right? In the trial that you're going through. No matter what it is. Okay? Secondly, reach forth with patience. With patience. Look at verse 3 with me now. Latter part of verse 3. Knowing, now watch this. When we talk about reaching forth with patience. You see, God says, I want to bring patience into your life. Is this God's word? All right? So God wants to bring patience into our life in the trial and the testing that we're going through. Now, the word patience isn't like some of what you think about. It really talks about f- maturity, completion, and maturity. Now, notice what he says concerning this thing about patience. What's the first word he says in verse 3? What's he say? Knowing. God wants you and I to know something about this trial. Knowing this, that the trying, there's the testing of your faith. See, that's what the trial is doing. It's testing our faith is going to work patience or it's going to bring about maturity in your life and in my life. Hello? Hello? So you see, this is what's neat about this thing when reaching forth with patience. We have confidence in our trials. What did he say? Knowing this. That's confidence. You can have confidence in your trial. Why? Knowing this. Knowing that this trial you're going through. Knowing that, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that you're experiencing this testing of this trial. Know this. So you can have confidence that you know it. So you don't have to go into it not knowing well, I don't know what this is all about. I just don't understand this. I can't figure it. Well, after tonight, you better understand it. And you ought to have a knowing about it because I'm helping you with that and helping me too. 
Amen? Okay, amen. Knowing this, that the trying or the testing of your faith does what? It works patience. Paul put it this way in Romans 8, 28. Are you all with me on 8, 28? Here we go. And we... What do we do? And we... And we... What do we know? That how many things? That all... That what? The trial you're going through? The testing you're facing and going through? Amen? It's going to work together for what? For good. You mean this trial I'm going through, this heavy manifold testing and trial that I'm going through that I don't quite understand, but now the pastor tells me after tonight, i got to understand it. That it's for my good? It's for my good? You mean this thorn in the flesh that you've given me, God, Satan, has sent a buffer to buffet me? This is for my good? Yeah, Paul, because when you're weak, I'm going to be strong, brother. And Paul says, if that's the case, bring it on, because I want the power of God on my life more than anything else. So we get to understand this. We're going to take it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. There's the first number one you need to do. You need to love God. Number two, to them who are called according to, here it is again, to his what? His purpose. The trial has a purpose. God has a plan and a purpose for COVID-19. It's not for the world, it's for us. God's not worried about the world because they don't know him. Jesus said, the world knew me not and I don't know them and they don't know me. But he does have sheep he loves and cares about. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me, and I am known of mine, and they're known to me. So we know him, right? He's our shepherd. Praise the Lord. And so these things are going to work out for our good. Oh, praise God. Look at this, Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory, say that with me, we glory in what? Are you glorying in your trial? Are you glory in your testing? Now look what it says. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So see, even Paul wrote about it, and so did James. And the word patience, again, is maturity. The Lord wants to bring out the best in us, and Satan wants to bring out the worst. See, when we go through the trial and the testing, Satan wants us to doubt God, doubt His Word, get upset, maybe get angry, get frustrated, get a temper, have a pooch face on our mouth, and like the world's coming to an end, and it's all over with, you know. Hey, God hasn't died yet, church. God is still on the throne, and the devil hasn't thrown him out of heaven because he got thrown out of heaven. My goodness. But see, that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to take the trials and the testings that we go through, and he wants it for our worst. He wants to bring out the worst of you in your trial. And if you get all upset and bent out of shape and get angry and frustrated and mean and cursing and you name it and all that stuff, then what's the devil done? The devil's jumping around like a glee, like having a party, because he just brought out the worst in you, but God wants to bring out the best in you. So let God bring out the best in you, because God wants nothing but the best for you. Amen. Listen to, I like Joseph. Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 50. And you remember Joseph? How many of you remember the trial that Joseph went through? And all that he went through, huh? Amen? Amen. Now, right at the first, he may not have understood it all. But look at this. Look what Joseph says in chapter 50 in verse 20. And by the way, when Joseph says this, he's 17 years old. He's 17 years old. Now, look at this 17-year-old young man says. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. What? The trial that he went through. Beat up by his brothers, thrown in a ditch, left for dead, then pulled out of the ditch, sold to a caravan, slowed into slavery, ends up in Potiphar's house, gets accused of, of trying to rape his wife and everything else. And I mean, then he gets thrown in jail on top of that. I mean, this is when a kid starts at 17 years of age. You talk about a trial. You talk about a testing. And the devil meant it for evil against Joseph. He meant it for his worst, to bring the worst out on him. But God brought out the best in Joseph. Because look what it says. Oh, this is great. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. And he saved the whole nation of Israel. And the seven-year drought and famine. What's God got in store for you and I? 
Don't be so eager to get out of the trial. God's got a purpose for it and a plan. And if you'll sit down and give some accounting to it, start giving some consideration to it, take a look at it, have some understanding, have the assurance knowing this, then you're going to start counting it all joy because God's got a plan and a purpose. And the devil means it for your worst and to beat the daylights out of you. And God's got nothing but the best for you. God wants to use you in this time. God wants to use this church in this time. It's to get the gospel out and get people saved. I don't know how long this ridiculous thing's going to last and go. But thank God we're in here tonight. And we were in here this morning. And bless God, we're going to continue to meet in here as long as our governor allows it. And pray for these others. That God will get a hold of their governors and mayors and judges and all this nonsense. You should have heard stuff this morning going on in the state of Oklahoma. It would curl your hair. You talk about Nazism. Lord have mercy. My goodness, and this was voted on by the House and the state of governor in, in Oklahoma. See, they don't want anybody to tell the truth. So I can tell it to you in here, and then you can go and share it with others. But oh, my goodness, what they're doing in Oklahoma. I'll tell you this in just a minute as soon as we wrap this up. All right? The world is looking for people whose faith is not only spoken, but also proven. It's one thing to say you have faith, and James says prove it. This is the same James that wrote this in, the next, in, verse, in chapter 5. He says, your man comes into church and he says, I've got faith. James says, okay, prove it. Prove it. All right? So that the, our brother Peter says that the trial of your faith, the testing of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and, and honor and glory. When, church? At his appearing. So you see, there's another purpose for your trial and your testing. So that it'll bring about praise and glory when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory. That's why you ought to be rejoicing, praising God, jumping up and down. Thank you, Jesus. Amen for this. Hallelujah. Because Jesus could come tonight, and I'll tell you what, it'll seem like nothing when you see him appear in the clouds of glory. That's how we're to live our trials. All right, and then we notice not only we have this confidence in trial, but look at verse 4 now. We have the continuance in trial. Oh, I don't like that one. We're going to have to continue in trials. Look what it says in verse 4 with me. Okay, are you there? But let patience, here's a conjunction now. The faith's going to work your patience, but look at the continuance of it. But let patience have her perfect work or mature work, that ye may be perfect or mature, entire, wanting nothing. Okay, so there's a continuation. James here is talking about enduring the trial. In other words, and he's talking about let God do his perfect work in your life. Let God do his perfect work in my life. Whatever God wants to do for you in your life in this trial, God wants to do something in your life. So let him do it. And it may last for a while. Don't worry about it. Okay? God wants to do a perfect work in you. God wants to do a perfect work in our church. And during this time, folks, in this trial, let me say what Winston Churchill said. Never Never, never give up. Never, never quit. Never, never will Britain surrender. Well, that's it. Praise God. Listen to what the proverb said. You know it. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Then lean not unto thine own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So let God, let God's perfect patience have her work in you. Okay? Don't fail in the continuing of your trial. See, don't get into your trial and then fail. Don't drop out. Don't quit. Don't surrender. God has a plan. God has a purpose. Give him the glory in it. Let God perfect you, mature you, complete you in the trial so that there'll be glory in it. Amen? See, church, it doesn't matter how great the pressure is. What really matters is where the pressure lies. Be sure that it doesn't come between you and the Savior. Don't let your trial come between you and Jesus. It can because you can let it overwhelm you. 
and you can get your thoughts on it and your mind on it and you just keep focusing and concentrating on it and it's going to overwhelm you and then that trial then comes between you and your Lord and don't let it because you are more than a conqueror who then who loved it loved you amen no matter what the trial is you're going through it could be a trial of loneliness it could be a trial of finances. It could be a trial of bankruptcy. It could be a trial of, of anything. It could be a trial of depression. It could, be a, it could be all kinds of trials. They're all trials. But you have the promise and the assurance that God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even up to the end of the world. I'll stick to you closer than a brother. You may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but you don't need to fear no evil. For why? For thou art with me. And even in the midst of the trial, the David says that my Lord will anoint my head with oil till my cup runneth over. You see, thou will prepare, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy, in the presence of my trial, in the presence of Splitfoot himself. God's going to set you up a banquet table. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man, it doesn't get any better than this. When we come to the trial, there has to be a cleansing in the trial. There needs to be a cleansing in that trial. There needs to be a cleansing in your life. You see, the, the, the goal is perfection. The goal is maturity. That's why he says, wanting nothing. In the trial, we become mature in Christ where we don't want anything, don't need anything. Because all we need is Jesus. Amen. Has to be a time of maturity. Because he's all talking about the patience and the working of patience and all that, and that's maturity. It has to be a time that God brings us to a place of maturity. So there's got to be a, a con listen to what it says here in 1 Peter 5.10. But the God of all grace, how much grace? Who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Now watch that. We're going to be called unto the eternal glory. We're not there yet. You haven't gone into the eternal glory yet, have you? I don't think so. You're all still sitting here, Amen. After you have what? After you have what? Say, that's me. There's going to be some suffering along the way before God calls us into His eternal glory. See, we won't appreciate that eternal glory until we go through some of this stuff. Amen. After you have suffered a while, He will make you perfect, complete, mature, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. Woo! Look at all those promises we got from God. Well, let's finish it up real quickly. The third gift. So the first gift we get in the trial is understanding. The second gift we get is patience, maturity. The third gift we get, ah, I like this, is wisdom. Reach forth with wisdom this year. Verse 5. Reach forth with wisdom. How many of you need some wisdom tonight? We need wisdom in the trial. All through this time, for these past 10, 12 weeks, I have God, asked God every day for wisdom. Every morning when I walk my dog. That's my time with the Lord. It's my quiet time. Out in the woods a little bit, got some houses here and there. He and I take off 7 o'clock. He's dragging me. I don't walk him, he walks me. Even the neighbors are saying, how's the walking going? I said, he's doing great. He said, he's walking you, isn't he? I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, we see you stopping and panting. And, uh, he, and I said, yeah, I need some oxygen. I'm going to start wearing a mask, a breather mask or something. Just make sure you all around your house has got defibrillators. I may need one. First thing, I walk out the door before we get started. Good morning, Lord. Well, I know you're in the north, so good morning, Lord. How was your night last night? Even though it's daytime for you. You never sleep or never falter, or never slumber. But thank you for the good night I had. Thank you for the four hours of rest I got. I would like a little bit more, but hey, I'm thankful for the four hours. Praise God. Now today, we need to have your will done in my life. Today, I need to realize that I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to the old man, but I'm alive unto God. Amen? Amen? And I don't have to let sin rule and reign in my mortal body today. Now, Lord, I got a lot on my plate. And right now, I got a church I'm worried and concerned about. And all this is going on. And I said, God, I don't know what to do. I need wisdom. 
God, I need wisdom when to go back to church, when to start, what we're going to do, when all. God, I need your wisdom. I'll ask for her wisdom. It's a godly woman. Tremendously uh, uh, wisdom in the Lord and, and, and so forth. And I turn to her many times. because I know the Lord heard her close. Sometimes I have to have the Lord. Do you mind getting out of the way so I can get a little closer to her? If you don't mind, please. But that woman's in tune with the Lord. She's a prayer warrior. Godly counsel she gives. And so I'll seek wisdom there. Then when it comes to things with the church, I'll sit down with the chairman of my deacons. And I said, let's talk. I'm at a standstill. You know, I, I, I want some opinion from you. What do you think? That we should this or that? I'm seeking counsel. And I always like the response whenever we finish. Whatever you do, I'm behind you. Amen. Whatever you do, I'll back you. Amen. That's good enough for me, man. I want to hear more than that. That's good. Doesn't get any better than that. Even if he may disagree. I say, well, I'm not sure about that, Pastor. Are you sure you want to do that? I mean, should we do that? And we'll, I said, well, let's talk about it. And we'll talk about it. But then when he said, but regardless, whatever it is, the outcome is, you're the pastor. Amen. And I'm going to back you and support you and follow whatever, whichever way you want to go and do it. Amen. And I'm grateful for that. But I ask God for wisdom all the time through this. Because, boy, we do need it. Amen? Amen. See, God doesn't want to get me out of the trial. He wants to conform me in the trial. All right, so first thing, listen, we've got to wrap this up. Got to go. Reach forth with wisdom. Number five there. Number three, our third one tonight. Our third gift is wisdom. Verse five. And first of all, I want you to notice, A, there, our need for it. Church, we have a need for wisdom. Amen? Amen. Ask for it. Look what he says. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Matthew 7, 7 and 8, Jesus said this, Ask, it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, every, and, every one, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. See, first we're told to use a verb here, an action verb. We're told to ask. Ask. Seek. Find. Then he adds a present participle here into it. He says, now for everyone that asketh. That's a continual repeated. Present participle. A continual repeated asking. You keep on asking. And you will receive it. You keep on seeking. And you will find it. You keep on knocking. And it shall be opened. So in the trial, James says, you need wisdom. Well, I don't understand that. Ask God for wisdom. I don't know what to do. Ask God for wisdom. Amen. Quit trying to do everything on your own. He's smarter than we are. Okay? Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, so here's, there's the key. Ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. But you see, notice he used the word will. It has to be in accordance to God's will. And then lastly, we're done. God's provision. See, when we reach forth with wisdom, we have a need for wisdom. I have a need for wisdom. You have a need for wisdom. And then we have God's provision. Look what God's provision is. What's the provision? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask God who, what? Here's the provision. Who giveth to all men, how? Liberally, freely, and upbraideth not. That means with no strings attached. Okay, there's the provision. God will give it to all men. How? Liberally, that means freely. Upbraideth, that means with no strings attached. Proverbs 2, 6 says this, For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Isn't that what we want in the trial? So here's a conclusion for the night. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. You know why we can suffer these trials and go through them and we need not to be ashamed of them? Because I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded, church, that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. 
Can we give God a praise tonight and praise Him and thank Him? Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank You tonight. We praise You for our lesson we've learned tonight from Your Word about wisdom, patience, and understanding. The three gifts that You give us in the trials that we go through. Now help us now that we've learned something. Now that we've been hearers of the Word, help us to be doers of the Word now and to put it to practice and apply it in our lives in the days ahead, even tonight as we go home. Start praising the Lord, giving you glory and praise. Help us to consider, to look, to account for this that we're going through because you have a purpose in it and a plan for it. You want to use us mightily and greatly for Jesus. And Father, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and praise the Lord. Amen.